Today, we have our concluding talk on uh, Meta Ethics, and we will talk about Moral Nihilism. Now, what does Moral Nihilism mean? If you take a look at the slide, well any nihilistic uh, nihilism, means a uh, denial of existence, or what is said to be uh, absent. Well, uh, let us briefly talk about, what we mean by nihilism, and moral nihilism. Now, nihilism is a, a, a more general metaphysical, or a philosophical theory, uh, which talks about the absence of any particular uh, uh, postulated entity, or mentioned entity. So, uh, nihilism simply, simplistically put, means that there is nothing. So, if I am a, a nihilist about uh, God, so I am denying that there is anything called God. If I am uh, a metaphysical nihilist, I am denying that there are any um, uh, metaphysical entities. If I am a physical nihilist, then I am denying that there are any physical uh, entities. So, various versions of nihilism are about, uh, uh, denying the existence of certain entities. Now, so by, by the very meaning of it, moral nihilism comes out to mean, that well, something that denies the possibility of uh, moral, of the moral domain, of the moral uh, uh, agent, of the entire moral drama, if you may say so. Now, what does this mean? Now, many of us would be having an impression, or would be wondering that, well, perhaps there is nothing really right and wrong, and everything is a figment of imagination. Everything is, uh, uh, as, as, as a proposition, or as a truth claim, is uh, unverifiable, and perhaps that is why it is false. Now, it, uh, such a theory, definitely is not unheard of in philosophy. In fact, uh, nihilism has been a, a standard denial, of many positive uh, discourses. But let us see, uh, what does moral nihilism claim? Now, if you look at the slide. Uh, well, uh, moral nihilism, denies the existence of the moral domain. Now, what does this mean? Does it mean that, uh, uh, nothing that uh, say, uh, nothing called right and wrong, or good and bad? Well, now this term that we use, nothing, is not an insignificant term. In fact, it is uh, having a lot of meaning. So, uh, what exactly do we mean by nothing? Do we mean that, well, uh, it is meaningless, or that it is unverifiable, or that say, it is self-contradictory. Let us take examples of these, that would perhaps further clarify. Let us talk about something called an entity X. Now, if I say, X is Uberto, it does not mean anything. If I say that, X is uh, a human being, who is immortal. Oh, and the third entity we use, that X is a square circle. Now, there are these three uh, possibilities, that we are considering, that are these three, of these three, which is an example of, what is it for X to be nothing. or nihilism about X. 
So, does it mean that well x cannot be comprehended or does it mean that uh, it is unverifiable or does it mean that it is self contradictory. Well, this is how we see the word nothing used can have various meanings. Now, what exactly do we mean by moral nihilism? Well, moral nihilism could have different strains, which could mean either of uh, the examples that have been listed. Now, if I say that well, the moral claim is meaningless. Let us say, now if the moral claim is meaningless, it would mean that well, uh, whatever I, uh, uh, when somebody makes a claim that such and such act is right or good or wrong or bad, it does not register any meaning with uh, the, uh, the listener. Now, if, if the speaker says that well, uh, uh, torture is wrong, the listener cannot comprehend what does the speaker mean. But if uh, uh, this is when uh, uh, it is being said as meaningless, when when the speaker says that well. Uh, uh, torture is wrong. The speaker understand, uh, the listener understands that well, the speaker does not approve of torture, that the speaker has a belief that torture is uh, wrong or incorrect or, un, uh, or should be avoided. But how does he know that it is true, that it is just a matter of the speaker's belief. And third would be, when it is uh, uh, self contradictory or when I say torture is wrong, that well, uh, uh, there is something uh, right in torture, which is being contradicted by this claim that torture is wrong. Well, most of the, the strains of nihilism that we are familiar with, is uh, uh, when we talk about the first and the second. Now, first is when, uh, uh, who, who is a psychopath, when one does not register with the, uh, in the moral domain. So, uh, moral uh, sentiments like remorse, guilt uh, or uh, uh, pride or uh, ju uh, judgment of right and wrong are simply absent. So, when I am trying to or when, when, when and when a policeman is trying to explain to a psychopath that well, what you did is wrong, the psychopath perhaps does not understand that what he has done is right or wrong. He, whenever the terms right, wrong, good, bad or moral adjectives are used, it seems to be in another language, it seems to be meaningless to the psychopath. Well, I did what I wanted to do and I do not know what you mean by saying that it is right or wrong or good or bad or whatever other moral adjective you use. Now, this is a, a, a case of a psychopathic moral nihilist. So, whose complete denial of the moral domain that imagine going through the world without having any moral domain. Now, the second strain or which I may call, which I may call the uh, lighter strain of moral nihilism, right. Let me list it down for your convenience. First is, these are all strains of moral nihilism. cannot understand moral terms or moral adjectives. The example would be the psychopath. Now, second is one who cannot verify the moral claims and is therefore, understands, but cannot see uh, perceive it, cannot know it as a proposition. Uh, let us see the example of what is uh, meant by the second. Uh, we just talked about the first one. The second one is somebody uh, who is talking about, uh, who when, when, when comes across moral claims, uh, can make sense. Uh, the emotivist being uh, to a certain extent, one of such a kind that well, I understand what you say, when you say that uh, um, x is wrong, but 
I do not know if there is a way I can verify that x is really wrong, or x is wrong independent of your opinion, that x is wrong is just your opinion, it is not uh, objectively verifiable. Now, if this is uh, also a strain of moral nihilism, where uh, moral claims are uh, uh, understood as opinions. So, moral claims come out to be as opinions, and therefore, unverifiable. So, if you say that torture is wrong, and somebody else says that torture is right, it does not make a difference, because none of it can be verified, and therefore, we cannot know what is true. Now, uh, let us look at it this way. Uh, a moral nihilist is denying, what is uh, uh, the claim of uh, the entire moral domain, that there is anything called morality, that exists. Well, whatever it exists first, the first version of it is denying that there is nothing called morality. The second, or the weaker, or the lighter version of it, uh, sees it as storytelling, or as a fiction, as an error theory. So, when let us uh, consider this as fiction, on which in technical terms, in philosophy has been known as error theory, that well, uh, moral claims are unverifiable, uh, or moral claims are unverifiable, therefore, not propositions. And what is a proposition? A proposition is something that can be either uh, classified as true or false, and therefore, not propositions, but are still meaningful. Or useful. Useful for what? Useful to enlighten of the about the speaker's feelings towards the act. Let us say, so now, uh, when we talk about fictionalism, or the moral domain as a fiction, it is something, which is frequently referred in philosophy, as the as if version. So, uh, let us say, the stories that we come across, uh, uh, let us say, the talk of Santa Claus, or mythological characters. Uh, we start believing that uh, uh, them as uh, uh, real entities, that is they exist independent of our perception, they are not a creation of our imagination, as children. And as we grow up, we perhaps uh, try, uh, learn and realize that, well these are fictionally, uh, uh, fictional, uh, fictional characters, and uh, this is a work of fiction, and therefore, it is not true. But yet, a fiction of a useful kind, because it conveys something useful. So, in that way, because there have been strains of moral nihilism, uh, which uh, can be debated, whether they could be put into the domain of moral nihilism at all, because they subscribe to another metaethical foundation, uh, which have, which uh, uh, could uh, claim some moral rules, but yet not, uh, yet deny the utility of any uh, moral uh, domain at all. They would fuse with the border lines of naturalism. Let us take an example. Let us say, we are playing a game. Now, as, as soon as you are playing a game, you see that, well there is a, a, a conflict of rules, that uh, uh, unless until there is, a, sorry not a conflict of rules, but there is a set of rules. Now, uh, unless until there is a set of rules, uh, we cannot uh, play the game. Now, these set of rules are nothing uh, absolute or valid, beyond the uh, a game, but when within the game, it is absolutely meaningful, and it is valid. Now, the moral rules could perhaps be, to a certain extent like that. Now, uh, these have, uh, 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 these are not strictly moral nihilism, but this is what in philosophy, people have called fictionalism, or error theory of various kinds. Now, uh, the as if, is very important over here. Now, in fictional theory, when we talk about fictional theory, we talk about we 
we talk about something called as if. So, it does not matter whether that is the case that there is correspondence, but it is a, a claim of a useful kind just like we talk about the game that there is uh, there are ru rules only as long as you are in the game. So, uh, when the game is over the rules are over and the game is the greater uh, meta ethical foundation. Let us take an example. Now, if uh, uh, let us say evolution is the uh, foundational or fundamental ethos that well uh, uh, survival or the propagation of one species and betterment of the same. Now, if this is the fundamental ethos, which is analogical to the game, the rules of the game, which is analogical to moral uh, 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 principles um, of the society, is to further the evolution of uh, and uh, the uh, survival and the propagation and the evolution of the species. Now, let us let us take a look at it, how does it seem uh, figuratively. Now, figuratively, if this is uh, evolution and this is a game. Let this be the ethos, evolution and the game and let this be the ethos. Now, we take a look at the rules of the game or the moral principles. So, the rules of the game are equivalent to the analogical to the moral principles. The end of the game, these can be called as the governing principles and the end or goal is further the ethos in either cases. So, here we see this well then, there is no no objective or verifiable reality. Everything is just true as long as the game lasts. Right. If we, if we see the moral principles, they are only true as long as they further the cause of evolution. There is no uh, objective or independent or verifiable reality about it. So, this kind of fictions is something which goes on without a need for uh, uh, verification. So, uh, this comes close to ethical naturalism, where moral principles are reduced or understandable to um, uh, understandable in terms of non moral principles here, which in this case is the ethos of the project. So, the ethos of the game and the ethos as uh, evolution. So, whatever is the ethos we, cho uh, we choose, the utilitarian chooses pleasure and pain as the ethos, the evolutionary uh, theorist would choose evolution as the ethos. So, it is a non uh, moral uh, ethos, which can explain the moral principles, which are just mere constructs to keep the non to forward the non, uh, non moral ethos. Now, let us look at a, so the stronger version of uh, uh, moral uh, uh, nihilism. Now, the stronger version of moral nihilism denies the possibility of normative or evaluative 
interjection. Now, if other disciplines are to be considered or other fields of inquiry are to be considered, other fields of inquiry or uh, uh, the majority of the inquiry in other fields is descriptive or definitely not normative. What does it mean? It means that, well as a physicist, suppose I am trying to study gravity. So, uh, when the physicist studies tackles gravity, the physicist is actually trying to understand gravity and does not make uh, the question whether gravity is good or bad does not arise. So, there is no normative uh, uh, claim about gravity, no normative or evaluative judgment on gravity. So, it is just a description. So, suppose somebody a sociologist is uh, talking about uh, uh, the description of uh, uh, a society and the uh, characteristics and the features of a society. Well, uh, a sociologist is uh, uh, required to enumerate the same, find out the same, but not uh, judge the same. So, the anthropologist is uh, trying to study uh, the various tribes, their practices, but is not trying to uh, settle on norms or sit on a judgment seat. Now, every discipline has a normative part too, a normative part which uh, makes a judgement on the uh, uh, descriptive practices and suggests a, uh, a, f, uh, a future course of actions. So, what is it to be normative? To be normative is to judge the descriptive state of affairs. and to prescribe a future state of affairs. So, the stronger version of moral nihilism claims that well, this normative exercise in ethics, this normative or evaluative project is not possible. That is, we cannot assess and we cannot uh, uh, go beyond the description of a state of affairs. So, there is, uh, because the very moment that we have a moral domain, we are uh, making a normative or an evaluative claim a claim that is not part or uh, written in the description of the state of affairs. Now, let us look at this, what does uh, the moral nihilist mean? Now, if the stronger version of moral nihilism is talking about, well that there is no normative uh, uh, field possible, that uh, one uh, cannot first uh, assess or evaluate the descriptive state of affairs, and second thereof cannot prescribe the future course of action. So, if you look at it, it is a very classic case of two sequences. First, we have a, a descriptive state of affairs or description of the state of affairs. From here, we go to the assessment. of the state of affairs and uh, finally, we come to the prescription for the future state of affairs. Now, this is the normative or evaluative exercise.
and this is the descriptive exercise. This found, this portion forms the discipline of, uh, this is the major uh, subject area of uh, most of the disciplines, with a minor area for normative or Uh, evaluative exercise. Now, uh, let us uh, look at an example, something very trivial and something very simple. So, simple as uh, suppose one is uh, uh, making a, 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 a general prescription like, well, uh, exercising is good for you. So, exercising contributes to one's health and uh, therefore, it is good for one. Now, what is the difference between a, a clinical diag doctor, who is making a descriptive diagnosis, and a medical counsel, counsellor, who is making a prescriptive uh, suggestion. Let us uh, build it in a form of a story. Let us say, we go to a, uh, uh, this patient X, or person X, has certain uh, cardiological problems. And this uh, person goes to a cardiologist. The cardiologist makes a clinical description of the state of affairs. The clinical description includes, well, uh, two of the three arteries have been blocked with plaque, and therefore, the heart is not functioning normally. What is the remedy? The two of uh, uh, the heart uh, uh, crucial main arteries have to be opened up or a bypass surgery has to be done. Now, this is purely perhaps a descriptive uh, uh, approach to the problem. So, this is a description of the state of affair. Now, after the description of the state of affair, uh, the patient goes to a medical counsellor. Now, the counsellor tries to tell uh, the patient that, well, this is the situation, and a more uh, desirable situation is when there is no uh, descriptive, when there is no uh, blockage in the artery. And to reach that, one must have, uh, um, say reduce the content of cholesterol in one's food, reduce, do a little more exercises, and uh, take less stress, or whatever the suggestions that they come about. Now, these are prescriptive, uh, uh, the, the prescriptive component of the evaluation the uh, doctor, or the cardiologist, who did the assessment, is just giving a description of what condition your uh, heart is in. And the first stage of prescription there was a surgery, but the medical counsellor goes ahead with more uh, uh, cases of uh, prescription, saying that, well, not, uh, surgery is a cure, but there are some things in your lifestyle, that is forming, uh, contributing to this. So, perhaps, you have to eradicate these things in your lifestyle, to get a uh, better health. And here, the fundamental ethos is, that health is desirable over ill health. Now, this is the foundational claim. Now, how does one promote health? Now, that depends, that is how the medical counsellor gives, uh, their, uh, gives this uh, prescriptions, how it is to be done. Now, can, uh, if this is an example of a prescription description claim, can we work, or can we go through our lives, without normative uh, and the prescriptive claims. So, normative and prescriptive claims, is it possible? How does it comprise in the human existential situation? Because now, whenever we are talking about norms and prescription, we are talking about planning and 
altering or uh, deciding on the future course of action. So, a total nihilist, not just a moral nihilist, totally denies any form of of norms or prescription. If you look at this nihilist, who is totally denying the possibility of norms and prescription, will uh, also not be able to uh, say that, well, why uh, exercise is good for health, or one ought to exercise more. Because here the uh, foundational claim is that, well, health is more desirable than ill health, and it has been uh, inductively seen, uh, mostly and deductive to a minor extent, that uh, exercise leads to better health. Now, these kind of claims are also normative in a sense, because one is assessing that health is better than ill health. That when one makes a, judge, uh, makes a judgment, one is making a normative claim. Uh, so, I will leave you with certain uh, uh, things to explore and think for yourself, that well, can we go about life without making normative judgments, without making prescriptive uh, claims, that or is it a part or are uh, uh, creation of norms, a part of how we make sense of the world around us, or uh, creation of uh, judgment, or creation of uh, uh, standards, is how we make sense of the world around us. So, if we are judging something as uh, uh, right and wrong, uh, in, apart from the moral domain, even say in the physical domain, in the aesthetic domain, that well, why do I look want, uh, why do I want to look better than worse, or what is it to look better than worse. So, these are all judgments that we have been making about. In fact, the uh, if from one angle I may argue, that the way we proceed forward in life, uh, or the human uh, agent continues, is because of these norms that are found. In fact, this is also the reason why uh, decision making is many times a generalist paradigm, that well, ultimately the decisions to be taken are simple. Uh, perhaps, this is a reason why there is a justification for uh, uh, leadership in democracy, to be, uh, to have more of the uh, uh, trust of people, than to be meritorious, or uh, technically knowledgeable. So, this uh, uh, task of the specialist in a democratic leadership, is to bring forward uh, the technical dilemma, in general terms to the leadership, and the leadership thereof has to decide, what is the um, right thing to do. So, in fact, the leader's norms are uh, trusted by the people, and that is why perhaps the leader is elected. Whereas, uh, 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 the specialists are, uh, their norms are not uh, trusted by the people, or their norms are not put to the test of trust by the people their norms are just, uh, are kept independent. Only there, they are in their uh, position, the specialists are in the position in which they are, because of their detailed knowledge of the uh, uh, technical details. But, that does not make the judgment uh, enough. Uh, if we look at it this way, that well, no matter how much uh, 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 technical details of a situation can be provided, uh, that does not, is not sufficient to make a decision. Uh, a decision has to be always made, and simplified into, uh, what in general conditions, uh, or in general situation is about norms. So, as long as uh, the leadership on top, does not have to be a, uh, 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 a genius in uh, or a specialist in any particular trade, to uh, take a decision at the highest uh, echelons about that. Rather, the leadership has to be trustable, or has to have a uh, display, or uh, has to have a set of norms, that are trusted by the people. 
So, as long as just because uh, uh, taking the example of an uh, of a standard scenario that a doctor will definitely not make um, uh, a good doctor does not automatically become a good uh, uh, health minister. A good uh, or a sharp or a knowledgeable or an accomplished sci scientist does not necessarily become a good uh, minister of science and technology. So, these are uh, uh, issues and points and uh, directions that point out that well there is a difference between uh, having the technical knowledge or the details uh, of uh, or specialized knowledge vis a vis the normative or prescriptive claims. So, the normative uh, 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 claims are what makes the leadership uh, trustworthy. So, the normative uh, framework of uh, 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 an aspiring leader would in principle determine whether he is elected or uh, not by the people. So, trust is a, um, uh, a function of one's normative claim. So, this is, this is uh, just uh, 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 by the way exploration of uh, which you are free to assess and evaluate for your own self that well, what is it that makes leadership so uh, uh, non-specialized, that uh, it cannot be learnt or it cannot be uh, decoded or it cannot be algorithmized. So, this is an example of well, uh, power and the necessity of norms and prescription in governing our future action, because we are uh, looking for norms, we are trying to uh, have universally acceptable norms to decide on the future course of action. So, this gives us the future course of action, uh, a set of norms gives the future course of action, because if we strictly rely on a descriptive state of affair, then how do we decide or how, how are the norms for uh, uh, taking the course of action decided. When a decision is being taken, a decision is being taken not in retrospective, but in anticipation that well, this is a desirable state of affairs that we plan to bring about. This is the current state of affairs, which the descriptive or the specialized detailed wing would uh, bring in, but that by itself is not sufficient to determine what is it that we would uh, seek to uh, bring forth in uh, the future. So, that link between a specialized current description and uh, uh, how we would like to uh, and the future course of action is where there is the human agency and uh, uh, this section of uh, normative uh, uh, inquiries in various disciplines uh, that determines that well how we would like the future course of action to be that there is a moral consensus that say we need uh, to eradicate poverty the specialist job is perhaps how best we can do it but whether we need to uh, eradicate poverty, whether poverty is a good thing or a bad thing, that is a normative claim. It is, it does, it seems trivial, because most of us have an agreement about uh, poverty uh, being uh, unacceptable or a, or a very much a avoidable uh, uh, state of human existence. But that is because there is a perhaps a universal human agreement. Now, look, uh, uh, let us take more uh, uh, tenacious issues, say whether uh, uh, prostitution should be legal or not. Now, this is a certain question, which is, which will, which will be, which will have less, uh, which perhaps has less uh, concurrence than a question that poverty eradication is a requirement, or health is desirable over ill health. So, uh, these are where the norms of the leaders, or norms of the decision makers are uh, crucial in describing the future course of action. Because what the descriptive uh, uh, disciplines or inquiries or subjects give us is a current state of affairs. But how we would like the future to be is depends on the norms that we have. So, uh, we would uh, in the later sections be talking about uh, uh, what is uh, taking up certain uh, course of actions, uh, so, uh, uh, certain applied ethical problems, which would be quite uh, interesting and relevant, if we have been, if this section on meta ethics has been uh, uh, seeming too abstract and theoretical, but let me assure you that it is uh, uh, a grounding or a foundation for the applied ethical problems we disagree. In fact, 
uh, if I uh, see it as a reverse uh, pyramid structure, that the foundation of metaethics is small, but that variation in foundation, or variation in one's metaethical positions across agents, uh, determines one's uh, variation in the uh, applied uh, ethical problem. So, if somebody uh, uh, concurrence in me, uh, metaethical foundations is uh, likely to have a concurrence in the applied ethical uh, problems. So, uh, we will be talking about uh, applied uh, ethical problems, before that we will be talking about the moral uh, framework in the Indian tradition also. And uh, uh, so, uh, we, we, we should go, we will look forward to talking more about now, more applied and more uh, moral theoretical and applied moral ethics claims.